Well, hello, hello. Uh, got a package. Well, I got a couple of packages in the mail over the last week or two. And I haven't done a new arrivals video in a while, mostly because I haven't been receiving a lot of games. I've been playing the games that I own. I know, imagine that, right? Um, yeah, in the wake of, uh, of Game On, um, I have not gotten as much gaming in as I probably would have liked. I have not bought anything, um, which is pretty... Uh, unusual for me, but uh, I also am running out of space. But um, I did have some stuff come in that I had on pre-order or was a Kickstarter, um, and uh, I want to do a quick video and show that off. So first off <clears throat> is this right here, which is this really nice addition, as you can see, of the One Ring from Free League Publishing. This is the second edition of the One Ring. Um, this is the uh, this is like the special edition version of the core rule book. Um, this is like embossed. It's really nice. Um, and the paper quality on this, uh, well, first of all, just the production that Free League did for this uh, One Ring RPG is, is amazing. This is a, a really nice map of um, Linden and Ariador, which is where sort of the core rules sort of take place is in that northern part of Middle Earth, the former kingdoms of Arthedain and Arnor. But some fantastic art in here, um, and you can see that it opens up with a letter from Gandalf and some amazing illustrations. This, uh, this second edition was designed or written, um, at least in part, by Francesco Nepitello, who was also one of the designers of War of the Ring, which is one of my favorite games of all time. Um, but this is, uh, I've been eagerly awaiting this. I've wanted to get into the One Ring for quite some time. I had the uh, second edition pre-ordered when it was still with um, the previous publisher who lost the rights to it. I forget what their name is. Um, but they had a whole, um, the, the first edition that they published had a whole huge library of supplemental materials. You can see you can play elves, uh, hobbits, men, Dunedain. Um, and, and the game system is really cool. It's sort of built around... Um, the idea of journeying, and so, um, you know, it's less D&D &D and more, there's like some unique stuff um, with sort of taking a journey across Middle Earth and how your character develops. We've played um, a couple of the adventures from the starter set. Um, I'm not the biggest RPG player, but um, this one really spoke to me because I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan, and uh, obviously, I mean, look at this, look at this fantastic artwork in this game. Um, and it's a really cool system. Um, you know, the... Uh, Here's a hex, hex map. Uh, use this for, I believe, when you're journeying. Yeah, so there's all these rules for journeying from one space to another when you can move into a new hex. Um, each each member of the of your party occupies a different role and, and sort of like scout or um, what have you. And uh, there's rules about when you journey and how you journey. and kind of really captures the feel of Middle Earth. Uh, journeying in Lord of the Rings in Middle Earth. Here's the starter set. You can hear the dice in there. Um, but again, a really nice production. This is a super... Uh, thick box like reminds me of GMT weight uh, cardboard um, all this stuff kind of fell apart but um, it comes with some nice stuff so it comes with like this deck of equipment cards it gives you some uh, <clears throat> this is art on the back of each of these it gives you the stats for what you're looking at um, so that's really nice and then here's sort of the roll card so um, they're double-sided so someone's when you're when you're doing a travel when you're doing a journey someone's the hunter the guide the scout the lookout and you kind of have different roles that you take while you're traveling and certain things random events can happen and, and then on the other side you've got your combat stances so in this game when you're in combat you have to choose a stance every round and that will determine um, some effects about your dice and how you can be attacked and so forth the combat system kind of reminds me of something like Shadowrun Crossfire or um, Dragonfire which is the D&D version of that system it's not a deck builder, but the sort of um, how enemies engage with you and you engage with enemies. But as you can see, we've got so here's a catalog and some silica gel. But here's all the dice. So it uses a D12 system um, with two special results. So you can see there's the Will of the West and there's the Eye, and then a D6 supplement to that. So you'll usually roll a D12 and then some number of D6, and you're trying to get to a target number. Um, I got I got the extra set of dice. Um, the white one and the black one. Um, the the D twelves were misprinted. They should not have an eleven on them. They should have a one, and they don't have a one. Oops. Let's see if we can. Yeah. So, um, but they're fixing that. Free League is sending um, uh, some replacements uh, to everyone who backed, which is pretty nice. I, I really do like that the inside of the box has uh, it's like sort of a, a mini DM screen, so you can see here's a Shire Journeys event when you take a journey through the Shire, and some other reminders. Um, the game comes with some, uh, the game comes with some, oh, here's an, uh, whoop, let's get that out of there. 
I've been playing, as you can see, with uh, with some friends. We've been playing some of the starter adventures. So here's another version of the map. There's actually a paper version of this map in the box, but it's really nicely illustrated. Um, and you're going to use this for a lot of the uh, core set adventures because they all take place in the Shire. Um, prior, between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings movies. Um, but as you can see, it comes with some pre-made characters. Here's Bilbo. You unlock the ability to play him, Balin. And then uh, some of the... Some of the uh, the Hobbit families, members of the Hobbit families you might know. Uh, here's Rory Mac Brandybuck, Drogo Baggins, who I believe is Bilbo's father. Or Frodo's father, excuse me. Uh, Paladin Took the Second. <laughs> um, and Primula. So the character sheets are, you know, I mean, your typical RPG thing. You've got your different skills, um, and, and they're divided into strength, heart, and wits. Um, you've got some special... Uh, distinctive features that you can use while you're adventuring. There's a lot of room in this system for the DM to craft some kind of um, storytelling uh, on the fly, which is really nice. I've been DMing the adventures. Here's the Shire supplemental book, so anything you ever wanted to know about the Shire, there's some charts and tables in there as well to roll against it. But uh, again, fantastic art. Um, so, you know, anything that you want to do to build an adventure in the Shire is in this book. We've got um, here are the core core box adventures. I think there's four of them in here. Um, and they're pretty actually pretty well done. Uh, we've played two of them, and everyone's having a blast. We've been trying to get together every couple of weeks, uh, my friends who are into RPGs. Here's a, sort of a starter rule set. So if you don't have the core rule book, you, um, this comes in the box. So this is kind of like a, uh, an abridged version of the rules with everything you need to play any of the adventures in the core set, uh, which is a nice touch, really nice reference here. So you don't have to flip through 200 and something pages. Here's the map. I'm not going to open it all the way, but uh, it's, it's on a really nice paper stock. Um, and here's Linden. Um, I think it's double-sided. On one side, you've got the Ariador map that I showed you earlier in color, and then on the other side, you've got the Shire. Uh, again, very nice. And then here's some of our character sheets that we've been using that we Xeroxed. So, um, so all in all, a really nice package. I'm very happy to own this now, finally, um, after waiting so long for it, um, and uh, Free League's shipping it now. So uh, if you've backed it and you have not yet got your copy, you should soon. Um, there is a Dungeon Master screen that I also pre-ordered that I don't have yet uh, that hopefully will be coming soon. Um, that's got some additional stuff. There's a Rivendell supplement in that one, so you can make, uh, I believe, High Elves from that book. And um, there's you know a bunch of info about Rivendell if you want to leave the Shire and head east. But that is the One Ring starter set, second edition. And I'm really looking forward to this expanding, um, going to the south, Rohan, Gondor. Uh, there's just so it's so rich for for expansions and what have you. So very excited about that. All right, so let's take a look at my GMT order that I got in today. Now, mine's not going to be as big as most people's, but it's certainly big enough given what's in what was in the box today. But um, I did pre-order Salerno 43, and I'll do a quick unboxing of this for you. But I also got Pacific War, the game everyone's been waiting for, and this box is insane. Um, that is a big boy. This is a four-inch box. This is the first four-inch war, four box war game I have ever owned. I can't even hold it with one hand. It's so heavy. It feels like the entire population of the Pacific is in this box. Um, oh, God, it's heavy. Uh, but here, as you can see, is the entire Pacific uh, theater of World War II, playable from the operational level, playable from the specific battle level, and playable from sort of the strategic campaign level, which I don't know why you anyone would ever do that necessarily. This game is made from I, what I understand. I've never played the original, but this is uh, made to be sort of an operational scenario-based game, very similar to something like War and Peace uh, by Mark McLaughlin, which was um, which is essentially the entire Napoleonic Wars broken down into various scenarios, and that, yes, there was a strategic campaign that you could play, but uh, the game wasn't designed necessarily with that in mind. We'll save this for last because it's so heavy and there's so much in there. And everyone, there's a, been a bunch of unboxings already online, so I'm not going to go super through it. Through it, uh, as so detailed as other people are probably better. But Salerno 43, Allied Invasion of Italy. I've been very excited for this. Uh, Mark Simonich design, obviously part of his uh, 40 series. Um, and you know, I played uh, I played Ukraine 43, and I believe I played one other one. I can't remember, but they're very highly regarded. This is actually the first one that I own, and the reason I went with this one is for a couple of reasons. One. I was looking for sort of a smaller to mid-size World War II Hex Encounter game on a topic that I didn't have a, a game on for the most part, um, and something that was interesting to me. And I find the Italian front of World War II very interesting. 
There's not a, a ton of games on it, um, and this series is well-regarded, and it's a, it's a small map. It's a 25 and a half by 22 map, so it's not a full-size map. It's one counter sheet, and I felt like this would be a great place to start with this series um, and own, because I don't own anything on this particular topic, and um, let's take a look inside. Okay, so I have actually, I have opened this already, so this is not the first time I'm opening it, but we'll go through it all. As you can see, get Mark Simonich, Salerno 43. We've got 1d6, that's all you need to play the game, fantastic. We've got the rules of play. Now each of these games is not an overall system uh, rules for the Mark Simonich's World War II series, but um, they're all pretty similar. Um, and you can see here, the rules are only about 20, with the optional rules, 22 pages. And then we've got the scenarios and um, designer notes and bibliography and all of that. So not super complex uh, of a rule book, and obviously it's well done, color, there's some illustrations, examples, stuff that you'd expect from GMT. Uh, here's the here's the map, essentially. Um, we'll see if I can spread it out for you just to give you a sense of what's on it. Um, like I said, it is not a full-size map. It is only, it only has two folds in it. So it's a 25 and a half by 22, but as you can see, the Allies gonna be landing here on the coast got some holding boxes, got the turn track, the turn, it looks like the full game is 22 turns long, and um, a lot of bad terrain, <laughs> which means it's probably going to be a slog. Um, you can see reinforcement areas, it looks like, here. Uh, but basically the Allies are going to land here, and they're going to try and break north, and the Germans are going to try and stop them, and look at all those mountains. Look at all that bad terrain. Give me Gives me bad feelings about uh, playing the offense in this game. We'll see see how it goes. I'm excited to get this to the table. Uh, what else we got in here? We've got a campaign game, an avalanche scenario uh, setup. So it shows you when all the reinforcements come in, who, where you start on the map. Not a very counter-heavy game whatsoever. There's only one counter sheet, like I said. On this side, there's an optional start scenario. Be curious to see what that's all about. Uh, we've got one for uh, the Axis. And again, not very many Axis units here. Uh, Germans and Italians. This is it, essentially. Nothing on the back of that one. Um, we've got two copies of the player aid. CRT, explanations of the CRT, determined defense, which is another uh, thing in this system where you can choose to try and make a determined defense at the potential expense of your manpower to hold hexes. Uh, on the back, we've got the terrain and what the different markers do in the game. And then on the inside, we've got the sequence of play and uh, how mountain hex sides affect movement and, and uh, retreats and stuff like that. And then a couple of other things related to the invasion at sea, airborne drops, unit types, allied coordination rules. So it looks like basically everything you need to play is on here, two of them. Then we've got the counters. So here it is, one counter sheet. Um, I'm, this is really interesting. So it is a brown core thing, a uh, brown core stock that uh, GMT has done here, but it's different than the more recent sort of like quote unquote deluxe counters. Um, so for example, I mean, they're nice. Um, they're, it looks like 9 sixteenths or 5 eighths of an inch. It looks like 9 sixteenths. Um, there's not very many of them, so it's gonna be a very like l low density game. But like what I'm curious about is sort of the, the more recent GMT counters have been on a really thick brown core and they just kind of fall out without dog ears and I haven't had to clip them. These look like I'm gonna have to clip them maybe. Let's see. No, they... Let's, let's see what that looks like. Yeah, that's actually pretty good. So yeah, these are these are kind of in line with what they've what they've uh, done recently in their recent games. See, like they're they're very tiny dog ears, probably not even worth clipping. Um, you know, they look pretty good to me. Maybe I'll clip them. I don't know. That one's a little worse. But anyways, uh, so the counters are really nice. They're very readable. Probably fit into one counter tray, and that will probably fit inside the box as well. As um, I also sprang for the mounted map. For the game because uh why not always nice to have a mounted map and here it is it's the same as what i showed you it's just mounted um interestingly it's got an interesting texture on it typically uh gmt usually does like a linen finish but this is more of a like a smooth finish this is the kind of um first time i've seen like a smooth matte finish um it's kind of different than what i'm used to from their recent production so i'm not sure if they have a new producer or what's going on there it's very nice um and obviously it looks you know, like I showed you earlier. So, but the mounted map and the um, the counters in a counter tray should all fit in this one inch game box. Um, so I am excited about that. That very rarely happens. And it's always nice uh, when uh, you can store everything in the box that it comes in. <clears throat>
you know, maybe maybe the map won't fit, but yeah, that should fit a counter tray in there pretty pretty nicely, and the die can go in the counter tray. Um, okay, so that is Salerno 43. Um, I'm excited for this one. Oops, let's put this in here. Um, very excited for this one. Can't wait to get to the table. I've been on kind of a World War II kick lately, so that's Salerno. Now let's take a look at the big boy. Let's take a look at Pacific War. Ugh. All right, this one I have not gone through yet. So I, and I've seen some unboxing, so I kind of know what to expect, but like, this is just a massive, massive, here's the, <laughs> here's what this looks like, by the way, compared to, like, look at how thick that is <laughs> compared to a one inch game box, pretty nuts. All right, <clears throat> let's go through here. So what do we got? We have a core rules manual. That is a thick, thick piece of bind of paper. Holy crap. Let's see. This must be like all of the core rules. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, 62 pages with the index here. Um, 60, actually 60, the index starts on page 62 and it goes to page 68, which is pretty crazy. This must be like the total rules for the entire game. Like if you're going to play like the campaign scenario, this probably has everything in it. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. This is the engagement scenarios rule manual. So this this will be the what are called the engagement scenarios. So this is going to be your operational scenarios, basically, uh, the rules for that. Um, and I'm curious if you can get away with reading this without having to read this. I'll have to, I'll have to check on that. Let's see. Yeah, it says that this is for specific scenarios. Um, hmm, interesting. So engagement scenarios, these are going to be the ones, I believe, um, that are sort of your operational, so Battle of Midway, things like that. This comes in at um, uh, 39 pages with the index, so less probably. Um, and it looks like it contains all of the rules you need for the operational stuff. We've got the Battle Scenario Rules Manual. This is probably just for the battle scenarios. This one is 36 pages, well, 44 if you count the, the pages at the end, the notes pages here, but 42 with the index. This one, yeah, so this one looks like it's for the battle scenarios. Probably this, yeah, I'm curious if you can just read this. Oh, interesting. So it's got the same, it looks like it's got the same numbering system as the core rules, but then you don't have to pay attention to any of this in the sort of battle rules. So it just skips over a bunch of sections. So I wonder, if, yeah, you, might, you probably are able to just get away with reading this to start with the battle scenarios. I think they recommend starting with the battle scenarios, getting a hang of that, and then moving your way on up to the engagement scenarios. Very similar to Atlantic Chase, probably. And there's like a, even there's even more rule books in this than there were in Atlantic Chase, which I never thought I would see. Here's the scenario booklet. Uh, this one comes in at um, 72 pages. So every scenario in the game in here. We've got, oh, engagement. Okay, so engagement scenarios are, looks like they are the the smallest ones, maybe. Battle scenarios, which are like the larger ones that take place over multiple amount of time. Yeah, that makes sense. Campaign scenarios. So you can do various campaigns. This is going to take you lots and lots of hours. The, on the back of the box, it says this game can be played for up to 100 hours. I would imagine doing sort of some of these longer campaign scenarios uh, is probably getting you there. And then here's the strategic scenario. So, yeah different starts for the, until the end of the war. This is going to be sort of your monster game, you know, week-long convention kind of stuff that you're going to start to see on the tables. I really like the artwork on the covers. It's just really nicely done photographs. Um, wow, there's a lot of content here. Okay, there's another manual. This is the Battle of the Coral Sea. So this is the extended example of play. So this is if you're just trying to follow along with how something would work in a particular, it looks like an engagement scenario or a battle scenario, a yeah, battle scenario. Uh, you would read this. This one's a lot shorter. This one's 16 pages. Uh, also talks about on the back about learning Pacific War and how best to do it from Mark Herman. So that's interesting. All right, maps. Looks like we got maps. We got two mounted maps in here. Uh, here you go. Look at that. Interestingly, it's a very it's a very glossy finish. I've never. This is also new for GMT. I don't see them do this very often, which is like a very high gloss, smooth map surface, which is interesting. Curious. Usually they have like a linen finish, but this and Salerno both have a very smooth finish. This one more glossy than Salerno, but um, can we can we open one of these? Let's let's see. And these are full size maps, by the way. So you know, there's a lot of space being taken here. But again, very similar to War and Peace in that you've got two full-size maps to play the whole thing. 
This one is mostly ocean, it looks like. Yeah, and this is... Okay, so this looks like the northern... Uh, northern map, because you've got... You've got Japan. Let's, see, let's turn this around. It, it's kind of weird how they projected this. Like, all the text... Yeah, so here's the Kuril Islands, Sakhalin. Here's the USSR. So that way is south. So this is the northern map. Here's Alaska um, down here. Uh, and then... A lot of this stuff here, Marshall Islands, Samoa. Um, it's, it's weird because all the text is facing the player who's looking south um, instead of north, which is an interesting way to do it, but I guess it makes sense for some reason for when you're playing New Hebrides. Anyway, so that's that's one of the maps. I won't open the other one. That one's got more land on it probably. Um, but yeah, uh, there's a lot of holding boxes and stuff on the map as well. You can see we've got weather zones, terrain effects, holding boxes. There's a lot to this game. This is rated on the back as a 9 out of 9 complexity. Two dice, Japan, allies, and then a metric ton of cardboard in here. Holy crap, I don't know how. <laughs> Let's get this all out. Let's get this all out. Okay. So, here's here the uh, here's counter sheet one. Here's all the Americans, U.S. Navy, U.S. Army, Air um, interest. This is also interesting. These are these also have sort of like a matte finish to them, uh, more so than I'm used to GMT counters having. Um, again, brown core, and they'll probably pop like the Salerno ones. But like this, the the feel of them is different. Usually, there's like a a more sort of grainy linen finish to their counters. These are uh, like super matte and smooth. That's interesting. Uh, here's some Japanese Imperial Japanese Navy in the white, probably Japanese Army. In the orange, if I remember my Empire of the Sun correctly. Uh, more Japanese. Looks like uh, allies. So we've got the Brits. Um, the Dutch, probably. Nationalist Chinese. Oh, the yeah, New Zealand here. That's cool. Yeah, who are these? The Australians here. Okay, so the yellow stripe is Australia. We've got British carrier based in the gray. Regular British there. Uh, wow, so there's a lot. That's three counter sheets. It looks like there's nine counter sheets in here, maybe. Here we've got ground units. Obviously, that's going to be a big part of the war. Brigade and division size ground units. Japanese army, it looks like. The red is going to be probably... Looks like China, maybe. I mean, those are army group size, and they're pretty weak. So that's pretty cool. More Japanese ground units. We've got Japanese marines. Uh, lots of markers. Here's some engineers. Here's some more aircraft. There's just like a lot. That's counter sheet five. Counter sheet six. Here's all the naval units. That's important. American Navy. Yep. That's counter sheet six. Here's the Japanese Navy. And if you've played Empire of the Sun, you probably recognize some of these particular battle groups and ships. Here's our patrol markers. This uh, looks. These are. This is the British, probably, the Commonwealth, the Dutch. Uh, what do we got here? Counter sheet eight. Uh, these are going to be task force markers, it looks like. Yep. For both sides. Uh, bulldozers. Japanese surprise. Not good if you're playing the Allies. Torpedoes. These are all double-sided, by the way. I believe, I believe there's like a, a hidden side and then a, a discovered or found side to these, from what I recall correctly about the rules. Uh, here's a whole bunch of what appear to be hit markers. This is countersheet 9. Okay, so there's more than 9 countersheets. Here's countersheet 10. Okay, so there's 10 countersheets. These look like bases, so you've got ports and runways. Um, so these are for the Allies. It doesn't look like there are any bases for the Japanese, which is interesting. A lot of game markers. Time, Tokyo Express, Submarine stuff so yeah lots in here lots in this box i mean this this number of counters takes up that much room so i would guess that once you get this sorted into counter sheets you'll probably be able to get them in there but we'll have to see because it's probably going to take four or five counter trays um here's a replacement records sheet this is a, a notepad so you can tr keep track of your replacements which is interesting curious how that's going to work while well, you need a note sheet for it um, here is a paper map, which is uh, a, a sort of inset of what's in the middle of both maps. So a lot of the scenarios, I guess, are going to use this map, which is, here's Australia, New Guinea. So again, this way is south. 
Caroline Islands, Marianas. And this is this is a 17 by 22 map, so um, you know this you'll, you you can play with this easily. And that's uh, I think for most scenarios, I think you can play with just this. Uh, that's going to be important because there's a lot of display sheets and big display sheets in this game. So here's an Allied force display. Here's a Japanese force display. You're going to keep your task forces on these. Who's in the core? Who's screen? Unactivated, activated. Here's another force display for the allies. So uh, there's enough to have 50 ta task forces, basically, in the game, which is pretty nuts. Here's another Japanese display. Again, 50 task forces if you need it. Uh, here's another, actually more than that, 80. <laughs> if you need 80 task forces, you've got enough sheets to do that, which is crazy. Um, here is another <laughs> force display uh, for the allies. Uh, this one is yeah also single-sided and another one for the japanese this is where the japanese can keep track of their merchant shipping and the turn track if they would like all right so here is the operational display and this is a uh looks like a 22 eight eight and a half by 22 uh, so this is the, the, the day track. There's this whole like night day cycle in the game and you, it shifts scales. So you might start with operational, you might be doing day turns and then it shifts to hour turns or something so similar to that. I have not played Pacific War, but strategic initiative, intelligence table, random, uh, determination for day. Uh, like there's just so much going on here. It's, it's insane. Um, so that's a display you're going to need to have sort of laid out by the maps essentially. Um, here is another, okay, so this is the fold-out. So this is um, <laughs> a very long display here, and this is everything the Allied player needs to know. Um, combat results tables, the calendar, certain things happen at different times during the war, unit breakdown, strategic bombers, air missions, uh, mis <laughs> a flow chart for doing air missions, command point table. Eliminated units holding box, command point cost for doing things. Uh, that's a big deal when you're doing your operations. Uh, and then down here is the phase track. So seeing what phase of the turn you're in. And you can see there are very, very many phases. Very many. And then we get into this sort of uh, battle cycle. So if you get into a battle, you get through all of this. And then you go to these phases in battle where there's different types of combat. I mean, this is a very sophisticated model of the Pacific War. Um, here is... Okay, so that was the Allied display sheet. Here is the Allied screen. This is another chart that's that large. Um, yeah, 34, 11 by 34. This has got uh, attrition tables, submarines, troop quality differential. So that's important in this game. Ground combat results. Your troop quality is going to determine how effective you fight. DRMs. Uh, what do we get else? Okay, so here's the air naval combat results table. You're going to refer to this quite a lot. You're going to look at the strength of your units on the top and then trace down to what kind of action you're taking, which is fairly involved. Critical hits, same as Empire of the Sun. Here's the detection search chart. So when you're trying to find task forces, you know, what kind of unit you're using, what time of day it is. I mean, there's like a ton going on here. This is... Uh, this, you, uh, yeah, I don't know how you're going to find space for this game. You probably need two tables. Here's a Japanese one. Again, very similar to the Allied one. It's got all the same information on it. Likely, you probably don't need both of these, uh, although this is different, I believe, on this particular player aid and the game record track and has stuff. So, yeah, a lot of table space needed. And here's the Japanese screen. Again, this one you could probably only need one of because um, it looks like it's the same as the Allied one, although the search chart might be a little different. So anyways, that's everything you get in Pacific War. As you can see, it's just like a crazy amount of stuff. Um, the package, and this has been a long time in coming. People have been very excited for this one. And uh, I can't wait to get this to the table. This is a game that I feel like I could play for quite some time. My friend, my Prime War gaming partner, is a huge uh, Pacific War uh, fan. And so uh, I imagine that he and I will be playing this quite a bit. We did play... Um, uh, War and Peace quite a bit. Uh, a lot of the scenarios in there, we had fun doing that. It's very manageable to play it that way because, you know, you can play a scenario for a couple of hours, get a slice of the game, learn it a little bit better, then take on a bigger scenario and build up from there so you get um, a really nice sort of like cross-temporal feel for the period. Um, Pacific War, it's why I like operational games. They can cover so much. That's Pacific War, The Struggle Against Japan, 1941 and 1945. This massive, be this massive beast. And, uh, yeah, very excited to have this. Uh, let me know what you think if you've ordered any of these, if you're excited to play any of these, and um, I will uh, see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.